Welcome to the Shared Practices Podcast. We are doing another episode on case acceptance. And I have back with us today, Kira Dent is, is a longstanding friend of me. And I forget, George, did you have overlap with her in Sim Clinic at all? Yes. Okay. So both of us being Midwestern grads, we, we have a lot of ties here going way back. I, I just love getting on the mic with Kira. And in fact, this episode blew me away to the point where I said, okay, I want your content in our course. So we are building a course about case acceptance. By this point, by the time you're listening to it right now, it might, be, might already actually be out. Kira has a specific system for doing exams, for what the doctor talks about, for route slips, for handoffs, and all of it plays into case acceptance. And she's got it really dialed in. And so when I heard this episode, when, when we did this recording together, I was like, okay, let's, let's bring this into the course. And so she was very willing to bring that into the course. I'm excited for you guys to hear some of this on the podcast. And then also, if you're interested in, in the course, we'll have links to that in the show notes as well. Any, any thoughts on uh, excitement for Kira? Oh, yeah. No, she's, she always kills it when she's on air. She's one of those guests that comes very prepared, lots of specifics. So she's a great fit for our show. Cool. Here we go with Kira Dent. Before we get into the episode, we want to take a moment to thank Blue Sky Bio for sponsoring this season of Shared Practices. Our listeners know I can geek out about Blue Sky Bio. This is something that I love and I'm very passionate about. But Blue Sky Bio has realized that for every one geek that exists that loves playing with all these pieces of software and merging files and designing these things, there's probably four or five dentists that really don't want to mess with all of that. They don't want to be the lab where they're designing their own guides, 3D printing, processing, cleaning up, clipping, trimming, inserting guide tubes. They really don't want to add that workflow by a 3D printer and truly taking the time to integrate this into their practice. Because of this, Blue Sky Bio has introduced something called Lab Pronto. This is truly the Uber of digital dentistry in terms of treatment planning implants, surgical guides, ortho aligners. The way it works is once you're in the software with all the pieces that you need, there's a button that says Lab Pronto. You click on that, and now there's actually a list of labs with available time that you can choose to send your files to. They can help you treatment plan, they can help you print or design the surgical guide, whatever level you want to be involved with. If you want to do the design yourself and they print it, you can do it that way. If you want more help, if you want more of their involvement and less of your time, they can do that too. You are able to shop with a number of labs that are within Blue Sky Bio's network that understand what they're doing with this software and can really help you out by maximizing your time so that you can do more surgery, more ortho aligners, more patient care, and act less as a digital lab technician. To access these features, update to the latest version of Blue Sky Plan and just click the Lab Pronto button at the top of the software. Okay, I have with me today, Kira Dent. And Kira has been on the show. I don't know if any of you remember, she actually woke up at 4 a.m. to record an episode with me. And luckily right now, we've we've wisened up and realized that noonish is a lot better than 4 a.m. So welcome to the show, Kira. Thanks, it's so good to be back. It's always, I love podcasting and talking with you, Richard. I think you and I going back to Midwestern days there's just a fun synergy and it's always yeah. so good to talk to you. So thanks for, thanks for having me on again. Thank you. No, I, I totally agree. I, um, I was actually, before we called, I was re-listening to your episode on the dentist money show with Reese Harper. Um, yep. <laughs> I, you crushed it on that one. Let me think I'm going back. Here we go. March 21st, 2018. What would happen if you lost your, your office manager? So I love the dentist money show. I love Reese Harper. I'm like a big fanboy of his and you got on there and you just like crushed it with some really specific things about how to set up a budget for your office. It's like with Excel and super easy and anyone can do it. Um, you had some awesome key metrics and the way that you track those, uh, I can't remember what what else it was because I didn't finish the rest of it. But I just remember like when I heard that episode, I was like, I have to get Kira back on. She's just a wealth <laughs> of awesomeness. And, and well, I, thank you. Yeah. So I was re-listening to it at like two X before we before we called. So it was just so good. I had Ooh. to go back. Okay, yeah. Okay. I, I can only do two X if I'm listening to someone that I've already listened to before. So I can't do it if it's like the first time I've heard them. So that's it's like because I'd heard that episode with you and Reese before, I was like, okay, I can I can crank this up. Nice. Well, and Reese is awesome. I, I love him and his, all of his tactics. Like he just, he makes 
money's simple. And that's why it was, it was so fun. I was, I really appreciate being on that episode. So thanks for the compliments, but literally Reese is so easy. He makes interviewing so simple. So I give, I give a lot of credit to him as well. Absolutely. I, I want to get, get on his show and I want to have him back on. Um, so it, it's been a little while. Tell me what you are doing right now. So tell our, tell our listeners where you're, where you're spending your time and what you're excited about right now. Before we get, we're going to get into case acceptance. You've got a ton of awesome stuff around that. Um, but I just kind of want our listeners to understand who you are and where you're coming from. All right. Well, uh, my name is still Kira Dent. And if people, <laughs> nice. if people write me checks of Kira Dental, the bank actually cashes those. So that's, Perfect. A, that's a new thing. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but no. So I've been, I feel really, really lucky. Mark Costas and I are still crushing it in the DSI world. And I nice. feel so lucky to have partnered with Mark. It was kind of a a surreal moment because on Monday I went back to a dentist that I worked for seven years ago. And that was where I was assisting. And I was so immature. It was kind of funny to go back and think of myself as an assistant. And, um, and Wait, now so he this ask- week on Monday, you were in an office coaching where you'd previously been an assistant. So kind of, but not totally. Let's not, okay, okay. I wish that I had been coaching him. I just went in to see okay. the doctor that I feel gave me one of the biggest starts. Sure. Um, he, I was a bad assistant. I didn't know how to, (laughs) I literally did not know how to take an impression. I didn't know how to, um, it was Utah and I got my dental assisting license in California. So I didn't even know how to coronal polish when I went to Utah and they thought I was the worst assistant. (laughs) I didn't, I didn't remember how to take x-rays. Like I was a bad assistant. I remember I hit him in the head with the overhead light. I did the like fatal move of like blowing air into the an open socket and just shot blood all over his glasses. <laughs> like I was that assistant. I remember like sending the root ZX across the floor because I knocked it off and just looking at him like, Oh, I know that's an expensive one. It was just funny things. Um, I hated doing coronal polishing on propies. And so I would give the front office a hard time and say like, don't put kids under 12 on my schedule. Like just funny things that as you grow and you change and you evolve, you realize how ridiculous some of those things were. But it was just fun to see seven years ago, I was a dental assistant working in Orem, Utah, yeah. and I had no idea where I'd be. And then fast forward, we go to Midwestern. I meet Richard and all those fun students. Fast forward a little more, owned a practice in Colorado. Fast forward a little more. And now I have, I actually just did my first international in-office consulting about three weeks ago. Oh, wow. Where? So um, it was in Australia and I just booked an office for New Zealand for October. So Really fun. Are really you exciting. are you gonna go do the the Lord of the Rings Mordor walk? You know, like go uh, oh. check stuff out in New Zealand. Uh, if you're not a Lord of the Rings I fan, should. we can still be friends, but it would be a little <laughs> bit not as good as it was before. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I, okay, in okay. Just, I haven't watched them. All. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Kira, knife to the heart. Okay, we'll we'll move so, forward. I'll put them, I'll put that on my list. So before I talk to you next time, I'll be able to. Quote sure, it. But, sure, sure. So it's been fun. So now we, um, I have three other consultants that are on my consulting team and I feel we have just dialed in how to do in-office consulting. I am really excited because we've also expanded it to, I realized dentists have coaches and we do a great job, but I'm not a dentist. And the main time when I go into an office, I spend the bulk of my time helping the front office because that's the area that dentists, like I even know working at at Midwestern dental schools don't teach a lot of front office. And so None. <laughs> so with that, I recognized the need to develop a program to help the front office. So that way, when I go into an office, my time's not sucked giving to the front office and training them. I actually have tools and resources so I can spend my time really benefiting the whole practice. So in January, Mark and I launched Dental Masters, which is our online front office training company. And we have, it's been fun. It's been evolving. We had an online Um, 12-week course for your office manager to really learn what an office manager, like their roles and responsibilities. Because I honestly, when I was an office manager, I had no clue what I was doing. And so like from personal experience, what I wished I would have had, we created that. But then I started recognizing that as an office manager, you're busy. You're really, really busy. So to try and do an online course on top of everything else you're trying to do just was impossible. So we actually turned that into the course, plus you get a one-on-one coach. So your office manager actually gets a coach that helps them get through the course really dials in and helps with some of those trouble areas that most of the time office managers aren't really willing to even reach out. They don't even know that there's help out there or where to even go. So 
we created that and we have and let me so i i was asking about this before the show and like looking through your website i think this is so amazing because a dentist can learn all they want about how to run their practice and they need to and they need to understand what they want and and the systems and the culture and everything they're going to do but then to turn around and train your team so say you go away to a conference you go learn from a consultant to then turn around and have the patience, the time, the material, the the accountability to train your team takes a lot of energy and effort. Mm -hmm. And so for you to build an online platform and coaching for the office manager, that means the dentist doesn't have to take time away to train their office manager. And hey, guess what? If you your office manager leaves or, or you lose them because they have to go do something else, um, work somewhere else, um, or say that you had to fire them because they weren't so great. You know, now you've got a whole set of, of resources and materials where you don't have to start from scratch and you know you can effectively train and teach this this team member. Right. And that's what I wanted it to be. I I feel like everything that I build and create, I have the filter of my Midwestern students in my brain. I think of them as my avatar. And I think of what could I do to help these students that have now gone on like Richard and they're these fantastic dentists. And, you know, I have had the circle where I'll actually consult some of the Midwestern students in practice, oh, cool. which is super fun. That's fun. Um, I feel like they, they saw me as like the little lunch lady that was delivering tea <laughs> and now I come in and consult them. So that's a fun, a fun serendipity world. But Kira, can reality... I have another number eight? Like Kira, <laughs> Kira would literally hand out teeth to us. She'd be like in the sim clinic with all of the materials and supplies and teeth. And if you like jacked up the tooth next door or you like prepped your tooth and it looked awful, you'd have to go get another tooth to put in your typodon. So like Kira was the guardian of the teeth. I was. And it was really <laughs> funny. I felt like a tooth lunch lady most days. Like, yeah. Here's your composite. Here are your teeth. Like, <laughs> it was really, and I was in a cage. I'd like pace around in this little cage yeah. all day long. But oh, totally. so many good memories. Um, but yeah, so my my goal in creating Dental Masters with Mark was to just help all those students, all those dentists out there that this is a world that's hard. It's hard to learn, and you guys should be learning how to do implants and bigger treatment because all you can do, like as a dentist, you're the only one that can prep teeth in our office. You're the only one that can place an implant. So spend your time doing that and let me help give resources and training so you can actually maximize and be more efficient with your time as a dentist. So, and with that said, we then created training videos. We wanted it to be, and I don't, I, maybe I'm a dumb business owner. That's fine. I'm willing to accept that. I just no. want resources out there for people. So it's totally affordable. And I wanted them to be so dirt cheap that it was like ludicrous for you not even to buy the video. So, yeah. like, and it's funny to watch myself on all these videos, but I wanted people to hear, um, how to say things, how to talk money, how to have those hard conversations, yeah. like different things in different scenarios. So we built a bank of videos. I think we've got like over 80 videos. We built 30, 60, 90 day scorecards. So when you hire and onboard somebody, you actually have a plan in place instead of the, Hey, go watch Susie and let's pray you figure it out. Sure. And, um, and then six months slips by and you're like, <laughs> Oh, maybe this was a bad fit. We should have caught this sooner. Exactly. And then the biggest thing that I'm really jazzed about was we actually built like my hardest thing as an office manager beyond knowing what I was supposed to do was trying to get that like beast of an operations manual or office manual put together with all the protocols. So my training could be so much stronger for my office. So this year I wanted it to kind of be like scrapbook style, like plug and play, <laughs> drop it in. That seemed like the easiest way. And so we built a 650 page office manual for doctors to purchase. And it's literally in, it's so simple. I broke it down. I have every single position. There's job descriptions and accountability measures and end of day checklists and um, like just the whole routine of what happens from when they start the day to when they end the day. Yeah. And then we have all of those protocols line up with a, basically a glossary of every single protocol in your office with templates of how to create them. So it's so simple. And then I also have a design graphic team that will take it and you guys just type it all up and they will literally design it all for you. And it's beautiful. It's so easy to do. And that was what I wanted. I wanted to take that monster of a project that I could never wrap my mind around and make it so you guys have something so you can tangibly finish. It's it's like both a template and like a, like it's not a blank template. It's like a template that's filled out, but then you can edit it or change it and add in all of your specific info if you don't like the way that it is. And then send it back and they'll do all the formatting and the digital stuff to make it look nice and fit and then bring it back and you've got this polished office manual. 
Exactly. And then they also check in with you every couple of months to make sure that you're using your operations manual. So it doesn't just sit up on the shelf and get dusty, right. but they actually have set times to follow up with you, give you ideas of how to use your operations manual in your monthly meetings. So trying to keep it a living, breathing document for you, and cool. they'll do custom edits for you. So that's been that's been my world out there, Richard, <laughs> since um, I last spoke with you. And it's it's just been fun. My goal is to always give back and make dentistry better in whatever way I possibly can. That's exciting. No, that's really cool. And it's I'm I'm excited that I love your mindset of just like how can we offer resources that don't add the the load on the dentist to like have to do all of this themselves. Like how can we make this easier and and take away that burden? And those that's like the exactly the kind of service that I want to pay for. So um, what is your website? Cause I tried to find you guys and I went to the wrong website. So give me the right I know. website. I need to buy out dental masters. That's the dental lab because everybody goes to just dental masters. So dentalmasters.com um, is the wrong website. You will see like the wrong <laughs> a lab, like it's like milling something. And then it's like pulling something out of the oven. And I'm just like, this isn't Kira. Who is this? I'm giving them tons of free SEO, but, yes. um, it's dental masters now. Dot com. And if you can't remember Dental Masters now, just remember Dental Master Snow. I learned that you should always have somebody double check you before you name a website. So Dental Masters Now or Dental Master Snow, either one, you'll get in there. Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So is there Dental Masters Snow is also redirects or is it just if you say it Dental Master Snow? snow is yep. the same as dental masters, dental masters now. now okay yep N now, that was an oops <laughs> now we can make fun of it and we'll actually remember it which is perfect <laughs> exactly so dental master snow dental master snow okay dental masters now will get you there and there's everything <laughs> in there that was that was, we originally wanted it to be becoming dental masters but there was a website glitch and we had to quickly change the name last minute uh, and then somebody was like why did you name it dental master snow <laughs> I'm like, oh man, the moment. Now, now we need to come up like a backstory for who this dental master snow is. It's like Exactly. Uh, exactly. Oh, that's great. Well, cool. Well, um, so now everyone kind of knows how they can incorporate what you're doing into their office if that's something they're interested in. Let's talk about some of the experiences you've had as a in-office consultant. So we're doing case acceptance. And when I initially thought about this season, I thought it would be like, okay, what are the tools and language we're going to give to the dentist to be able to be better at case acceptance? But what I've since realized is that the dentist part in case acceptance is actually kind of like the smallest part. Um, and that it happens, it starts well before the dentist ever meets the patient and ends well after the dentist ever meets the patient. So what's your perspective on, on case acceptance and where offices get it wrong and, and where they get it right? Okay, so I'm really happy to hear your perspective because I'm going to offer a different opinion. Perfect. Because I actually, I think that the dentist holds so many keys within case acceptance. Okay. And I used to think that, I mean, being a treatment coordinator myself, I thought my job as treatment coordinator was to close those cases. And ultimately, yes, you need to be able to close cases and not be afraid to talk money. That's probably like one of the biggest things I see are the treatment coordinators are too scared to talk money. So they just kind of like a new dentist who comes out of school and is afraid to talk a comprehensive exam because they don't want the patient to say no. Well, that's how treatment coordinators sometimes can be when they're too scared to talk money. So they'll scale it back to get a yes. And it's just one filling when all they need to do is do five fillings. So, but I think if the dentist can be the centrical piece that actually is directed in their exams. And I've done this and I think I'm so confident with this because I've literally taken an office from 49% case acceptance to 100% case acceptance in one day with utilizing this process. Because I was watching and I watched a lot of exams. I go into offices. We have 130 offices right now that we go in office. Uh -huh. So I feel like I get a lot of data from hands-on from multiple offices across the, literally across the world. Yeah. And what I watched was exams are dicey. Exams can be really funny. And I think it's because dentists just don't have like a, a model was what I was realizing. They, they don't have their flow when they go into an exam. Some dentists do and they do fantastic. Other dentists don't. So what I did was I created a system where you don't miss it. And I just implement, okay. I've implemented it probably in five practices in the last week and they're dialing it in and they do so well with their case acceptance. So I call it the NDTR and I write it on my route slip. So that way this is not forgotten. So in case a dentist forgets it in the exam, the assistants are catching it. And this written on your route slip, everybody knows I am so big on route slips because I want 
a piece of communication from the front office to the back office and back to the front office. So we're all on the same page. Yeah. So we can dive into route slips another time, but you write literally on the route slip or whatever piece of paper is going to follow this patient throughout the day, write NDTR and that way, and have your front office be like the keepers of the gate to where they won't let these route slips or these papers come through without them being filled in. And so what the NDTR stands like, you're, for. You're killing me. I'm like, what's the NDTR? <laughs> what is it? Yeah, what is it? Tell me. Okay, I, well, and it's funny because I, can, I have not come up with a good acronym to help people remember it. But um, a dentist on Friday N-D-T-R. said it's he's a brand new doctor. And so the way he remembers it is new dentist, tough road. <laughs> so, <laughs> if anyone wants to remember, I thought it was hilarious. It made uh, me laugh so hard. That's great. Um, but basically the N stands for the next visit. The D stands for the date range. T stands for time and R stands for recare. So dentist, I need you to do the NDT. So when you're doing your exam, preface the patient. Okay, Kira, so what I'm going to do, we've looked at your x-rays. I'm going to lean you back. I'm going to take a quick look through your mouth. I'm going to say a couple of numbers to my assistant or my hygienist who's here, and then I'll explain it and recap it to you. Dentist, go in, you do your comp exam, you look for everything, tell the numbers, whatnot. Set the patient back up come forward so you're facing the patient. A lot of dentists sit behind the patient and I feel like lock eyes with your patient. You'll get better case acceptance. And at this point, you're going to then tell your patient, all right, Kara, so we said a lot of different things. What we need to do is we want to start up with the upper right. I don't care where you want to start. Pick your biggest burning fire. If it's what the patient, you know, obviously pay attention to what the patient said beforehand, which your hygienist and assistant should be prepping you on beforehand. Yeah. Um, But wherever it is, you, you pick your starting point. You'll say, we're going to start with the upper right. I'd like to get you back probably in two or three weeks to get that started. And it's going to take about an hour and a half to get that done. Boom, right there. That's how you do it. Because, so there are so many other things. Like we can talk about persuasion on your health history forms, which is so true. Proactive versus and preventative, like getting your patients to really get in that mindset. I believe so much in the Cialdini principles. Absolutely. So you should incorporate all those. But since I only have a snippet of time to really get the listeners to have something tangible that they can take. If dentists will use this model, I promise your case acceptance will skyrocket. Because okay. So why? Let's go into the nuance yes, of this. Yeah. That's what I want to talk about. So the reason why is because, so when we go into a new place, think back to like when you were in dental school and you have a teacher that, or like even me, when I come in, I'm like practice management guys, like office managers are so great. And I just start rattling off. Hmm. That is common jargon for me. Same thing with our patients. We talk about like MODO, we need a crown, root canal, all these different things. And to a patient, they have no clue what that means. This is not a common world for them. So already we have the stage where they're just listening and they're hoping and praying that all those numbers don't mean cavities or they have no idea what we're even talking about back there. And so what we've done is we've created this swirling mess where their brains are already thinking of too many options. Okay. Some of the main, the main reasons patients don't accept treatment are they don't know what they even need to have done. Okay. So that's a big one. They don't know what needs to be done. They don't know how long it's going to take. They cook up these stories in their minds that, oh, a crown's going to take seven hours and I'm mm. going to be here all day. They don't realize it's short. It's a quick, easy appointment. And the other one is obviously finances. So those are three main barriers that patients tend to have as to why they won't accept treatment. By you giving this NDT to your patient, you've eliminated two of those barriers already. You've told them what the visit is. They know they're coming back for the upper right, and we're going to do a couple fillings up there. You already have it solidified. They know where to start. They heard a bunch of numbers, but they know exactly where they're starting. Number two, you told them the, the time frame. And a lot of dentists are like, but Kira, I don't really want to pressure my patients into coming. Like, I feel like... Let me let me, let me me try and like process this as you're, as you're saying it. So next visit, that means you're giving them the starting point of their treatment. Do you still tell them everything in their treatment or do you just start with like what's next? I recommend that you have it up on the screen if you can, but you'll, you'll let them know like, okay, we have some treatment that needs to be done. We've got cavities in all the different quadrants. However, I want to start on the upper right. There's three fillings there, or I want to do the upper right and the lower right. We can do both of those in one visit, maximize your time. You always spin it to a positive. And yes, you do tell them the comprehensive treatment, but you have to give them a starting point so they can digest and easily come up with a solution of what they need to do to get healthy. Okay. Like they're just looking, they don't, they can't see the hundred foot vision. They can only see what's right here right now. So helping them to digest that, they know they've got a lot of treatment to do, but this is where we're going to start. This is your first step to success because if it's too overwhelming, they won't say yes. 
Okay, that makes total sense. And I, I love that. So n- next visit, and then D was date? Yep, the date ta- the date range. Date range. So, so is that like saying, I want you to come back within three weeks or, or within a month so that this doesn't get worse? Like, how are you, correct. Like what's, what's this, how do you phrase it and what's it about? Like, why is that so important to give that range? Awesome. So a lot of times I hear dentists and they'll say, we need to get that taken care of soon. Or I really like to see you as soon as possible. Okay. Or, you know, let's make sure we get this taken care of. It's not specific Those are so enough. gray. Those are gray because soon for me versus soon for you, like soon for me is I'm going to see you in the next hour soon for you if you hate the dentist is next year yeah sometime so before i die i should probably take care right? of this <laughs> and so with that when they say soon it's great why are we and our patients are already trying to digest everything we just told them why are we now adding an even bigger mountain where they're like i don't even know when i need to come back like i'm just going to push it off because it's too hard for them to make a choice okay our job is to simplify for them now dentists get really they, they think about this one a lot because they feel like, and I love dentists because your brains think about every single possible scenario, which is fantastic. That's what makes you really good at your job. <laughs> but they're like, well, Kira, this crown might not need to be done in three weeks because like, if like, well, like, am I really pressuring them? Like, I don't want to create undue stress for them. Like, and they really will, they'll have an internal struggle or on like this. push back on this point. So yes, what, what do you tell them at this point? And, and also I want to hear what range you typically kind of want? I mean, I mean, sure. it depends on the treatment and, you know, people can be flexible with this, but what do you recommend? Great. So I feel like, okay, bottom line is you just diagnose treatment. Yes. That tooth theoretically could last for the next seven years and not break off. That is true. You could have decay that's in there and it won't go anywhere for the next 20 years. Sure. Those are all true. But the other truth is tomorrow it could explode. Tomorrow it could break off. Tomorrow, it could have these problems. And the point is, if you're diagnosing it, why are we allowing them to wait three months? If you diagnose it, it's a priority and you need to make it a priority. And so that's where I think, Dennis, if they're confident with their diagnosing, you have no problem putting a date range on this. You're not manipulating. You're not forcing them. You're just letting them know this is important and this is when I would recommend getting it done. That's all you're doing. And I typically, so it depends. If your schedule is wide open tomorrow, you might want to say like, hey, I recommend we get it done in the next two to three weeks. I like two to three weeks because it's not immediate and it's not too far away. It's a really solid in the middle. So you could say, let's say tomorrow's wide open. Always think VIP customer service because that's, I believe the best dental practices. And I'd say, Hey Kara, I recommend, you know, we're going to start with the upper right. We've got three fillings to do there. I recommend we do it in the next two to three weeks. We want to make sure we get taken care of. You do have active decay. However, I do have an opening tomorrow. So if that works with you, we'd love to get you in sooner. And just so you know, it's probably going to take about an hour and a half to complete those three fillings. That's all you have to say. That's the T, right? And D, T, what's the R? The R is for recall. And I always want recall on there because when now this is where we go from our case acceptance. So our dentist says that and then get out of there. Don't linger longer. Move on, doctors. Don't stay because we don't want you getting into prices. You don't need to talk money. That's not your job. If they ask you like bigger cases, sometimes like with implants, patients say, well, how much is that? You can give them a ballpark of like, that's about 3000. A bridge is about 3000. But reality is, I don't know the numbers. Sally up front is going to be way better at that than I am. And you move on to the diagnosing for them. Okay. So you recommend that when it comes down to it, you know, they're laying out these specifics, the need, um, and what we're going to do next, the time range, the date range, and how long it's going to take. And then like, what about their other questions or, you know, concerns that they have? Is that more assistant treatment coordinator? Or do you think the dentist should, should kind of linger and talk about that kind of stuff? I feel like train your team. So let's step it back a little bit. Okay. One, have your forms talk about proactive preventative if the patient's that way, because then you can use that same verbiage yeah. as you go throughout. Number two, train your assistants and your hygienists to quote unquote, tee up your patients. So they should be talking about these things. They should be taking the intraorals. Intraorals are going to help your case acceptance exponentially because if a patient can see those pictures, they can co-diagnose with you. You're going to get much better acceptance and they're going to know you're not lying to them. Yeah. So if your hygienist or your assistants are really good, let them know. Some offices have them take a picture of every single tooth. Some have them do per quads, but intraorals, if you don't have one, buy one today, your case acceptance will instantly go up. So you do that. Yeah. And then your hygienist, like calibrate with your hygienist. 
teach them like when I see these cracks, I'm going to recommend a crown most of the time. When I see this, I'm going to recommend an implant. When I see this, I'm going to recommend gum grafting. So that way your hygienist can look and see. They can start educating your patients. All those questions, they can pretty much answer before the dentist even walks into the room. Dentist comes in, you reconfirm treatment, you talk about this NDT, and then from there, if the patient has questions, answer them because I believe that firm education from the dentist along with a directive of when to do things is what's going to create better case acceptance for you. Okay, cool. When it's, educate, when it's taught in the back office, because by the time they get to the front office, they should know exactly what they need to do, when they need to come back, and they should know why they're getting the treatment done. All the front office should be doing literally is figuring out finances. That's it, in a perfect flowing world. That's how I believe it's the best way to do it. Some offices do it differently. And let's just clarify. I think this is more for like your standard crowns, fillings, root canals. Sure. When you get into implants, there's a little bit different process to close those cases, but there's still the same flow to it. Well, so I, I like this idea that you're laying out that your hygienist is talking about the the needs and the probable treatment. The assistant is also talking about the same thing. Um, so when they, by that point, they've probably heard the concerns from the patients and they've already probably answered and addressed some of their questions, but then they've teed you up, like you said, to both, they've already brought up the treatment, they've already brought up the concerns. Now we can ask the doctor those questions if they still have more questions after your team is kind of a, uh, addressed what they could um, so that by the time they get to the dentist, this is like the third time or the second time that they've heard this and they've already kind of had some of their concerns filtered and answered and taken care of. And now the, their most kind of pressing concerns, that's the stuff that the doctor can educate them around. Correct. And I love that you brought this up because a lot of times there's the like doctor recap outside of the room. I'm a pretty big proponent to recap in front of the patient I know it takes a few minutes. So as soon as the doctor walks in, hygienist or assistant says, hey, doctor, hello, this is Kira. Um, I showed her her x-rays and I showed her intraoral. She knows that number 30, she saw those cracks on there. And hopefully at this point, if the patient's been educated, I would chime in and be like, I know it's probably going to be a crown. Um, yeah. And the hygienist, the hygienist says, you know, her concern is number 14 has really been bothering her with hot and cold. And we talked about the possibility of it being a root canal. She saw that the darkness up on her, on her x-ray. Um, but I told her you take a look and she's super excited. She's going on her summer vacation, wherever. So, and I love that happening in front of the patient because when it happens outside of the room, you can definitely do your recaps outside of the room. I think that's great. You can give more information that the patient, you don't really want them to hear, but saying it in front of the patient also helps increase case acceptance and lowers the number of questions that you'll actually have to answer because the patient all they know is that they told the hygienist. They have no idea at this point that the doctor actually knows what they've talked about this whole right. time with the hygienist. Right. So if you can have that quick little handoff inside the room so the patient knows that they were heard and that we're repeating the information that is most pressing for them, that's going to save the doctor so much time answering questions because we've already addressed them. And then you really will answer the, the deeper questions that the patient really has. As we've worked with Design Ergonomics, I've actually gotten to know the founder of Design Ergonomics, Dr. David Ahern. He's a dentist, practicing dentist, still practicing to this day, despite the, the many companies that he's running. One of the things that I love about him is that he is obsessed with improving the flow and productivity of offices. And he has delved deep into the research inside of dentistry and outside of dentistry, and actually had done a lot of experimentation and research on his own. And they've found that the flow and layout of your practice can help make anxious patients more comfortable and can make patients in general more willing to accept treatment. They've found studies that have shown that requiring a buyer to move from one location to another during the decision process has a negative impact. So we present treatment in the chair and then we take them to the front desk and they've found that decreases case acceptance. So to address this, Design Ergo creates operatories that are both comfortable and fully able to present treatment, take payment, and schedule procedures. This is just one aspect of the patient experience that Design Ergonomics has figured out and bakes into their project development and the layout of your office. So if you're doing a startup and have complete control over the patient experience and the flow of your office, why not work with a team who cares about all of these things who's done the research and who has done it over and over and over in very 
high producing, very successful offices. Reach out to Design Ergonomics. Go to www.desergo.com. We've arranged for exclusive discounts on a wide variety of services, so be sure to let them know that you're a Shared Practices listener. I'm, I believe that we did route slips on our interview when I had you on the show originally. Um, mm-hmm. So this ties back into route slips. And so when the the handoff to the doctor, when the hygienist is bringing the doctor in, so you're saying don't do this in secret out in the hallway, do it in front of the patient, which feels weird because you're talking about someone else who's in the room you've spent all this time with. Um, but at the same time, it's almost like there's like a weird warm fuzzy that people get when they're being talked about right you know it's like they feel heard and they feel that like okay the hygienist knows what i care about and like the important things and is communicating that information to the doctor so it's like rather than it being weird that like you guys are talking about them right there it's more of a way of like validating like no these are the concerns that the patient has and i'm passing them along here's what they already know and what we've already talked about um i think um it makes total sense to me both why people would not want to do that, but it also makes sense why it really works and why it's actually really effective. Sure. And I love like behind the patient, having the hygienist fill out like a quick little, it can be like a half a sheet that's laminated where it says like the x-rays that were taken, the patient's primary concerns, because doctor, when that hygienist meets you outside of the room and they give you the quick recap and you walk into that room, your brain tends to be thinking of like the 25 other things going on. So having that little slip of paper behind Um, and I can share examples. It's super easy, but basically it just breaks down what the patient's primary concerns are. So it's there. So as the hygienist is telling you again, like I said, you can have that little huddle outside of the room without the patient, because sometimes there are things like this patient's a gagger or this patient's crazy. You (laughs) You should know that. Exactly. Exactly. And, or they're going to talk to you forever. So let's have to, um, those types of things definitely have that quick recap outside. But the point of that quick handoff in the room is we recap the main points that that patient was concerned about. Having that little slip of paper behind the patient's head where you're going to be looking at x-rays also helps the doctors be more focused because the hygienist has already talked to them about these five things that they've written down. So you already know patients are most likely educated on these five areas that the hygienist wrote down. I can look through, quickly figure out my exam, either confirm or deny what the hygienist said and move along to my exam and give them that directed approach. So it works really well. Utilizing your hygienist, I believe, is a massive, massive, massive way to be more efficient with your time as doctors, as long as you use them correctly and train them on what you're looking for and how to help, quote unquote, co-diagnose with you. That's awesome. Well, And and I love the fact that you still recommend, even though you're kind of doing this out loud recap, the the written down thing, because I'm the type that like, I'm a talker. And once I sit down and start doing the exam with the patient, I'm going to be talking to them about other stuff while I'm, you know, doing my, my exam real quick. And to have that there visually to keep me back on track and to remember all the things that we talked about, like I wouldn't need it all the time, but the times I needed it, it would be really nice to just have a visual in addition to auditory. You know, everyone does things differently. Right. Um, so I think that's that's awesome. So that handoff, you've seen doing that out loud increase case acceptance. Most definitely. Yeah. Well, but... That handoff also, more than anything, it's going to make the doctor's time much more efficient yeah. and you won't have to spend as much time answering questions. So, and not necessarily that it will help with case acceptance. I think it does because the patient hears it again, but more than anything, it just makes your time so much more concise in that room. But the big area, the biggest swing for that case acceptance is the doctor giving the directive. Patients, when they hear what they need to have done from the doctor, patients accept treatment and it happens time and time and time and time and time again. When patients come up and the doctor hasn't been specific of what needs to happen, when it needs to happen and how much time, patients come up and they're waffling. They're like, well, is it really that important? How long should I wait? They're trying to make deals with the treatment coordinator up front. Whereas if the treatment coordinator, it's written down on the route slip. So they literally can be like, well, Dr. Lowe said we need to get you back in two or three weeks for an hour and a half. Let's make sure we get you in. And you just go right into scheduling and then figure out the finances. It works like magic. That's awesome. So for this, the the front desk, do you recommend um, a treatment coordinator that's a separate person from the person who's at the front desk answering phones and taking patients in? You know, like at, at what point do you recommend someone dedicated to treatment coordinating? So anyone who knows me knows that I am not a big fan of one solo front office. Okay. I don't like it. I think it 
um, that's where embezzlement happens all the time. And it's usually when there's only one person working up front. Hmm. So just for people to be covered, I say just have two people up front all the time. People are like, but Kira, my overhead. And I'm like, I know my offices sit at 50% overhead is what I aim to get them at. So I'm super aware of overhead, yeah. but having two people up front, even when you're not a super busy practice, because that's the hard part. I hope that bringing on two, you're motivated to be more productive and using this NDTR, you're going to get your books filled more. But I like to have two people there. I like to have one person who does the scheduling, answers the phone, checks patients in. And then the checkout person is typically your treatment coordinator. Or if you're in a smaller practice, that treatment coordinator is also your office manager. And really having them, I like it because when there's a set person who does the bulk of it, even if you can have multiple people that do it, but one person is primarily over that. I like them to follow up on all their treatment plans that didn't schedule that mm. week. I like them to track how they're doing. That way you can see, hey, we're like not, we're not scheduling yeah. my root canals. Why are my root canals not scheduling? I need to do better with my exams or gosh, my implant cases really aren't scheduling. I wonder why I need to switch something up there. So having a designated person to follow up on the calls who knows what's going on yeah. and is a sole person on it. I personally prefer that model. And I like them to also track with a treatment tracker just so I can see what types of procedures are being accepted versus which ones aren't and how we can fine tune that to make sure we dial in that case acceptance. Okay. So you know, the advantages of having this second person up front is, you know, one, they're not going to be while they're talking about treatment and scheduling these patients, they're not going to be missing phone calls. There's not going to be people waiting for them at the front desk. But more importantly than that, this person has ownership of people coming back for treatment of, of not just, you know, because treatment plan acceptance doesn't finish until the treatment's actually done and the money's collected. So they're going to know, okay, X, Y, and Z, this type of patient is not scheduling or we're, we're falling through here or, or we're having this problem. So they can track that. So do you have them, like, what kind of metrics are they tracking specifically for case acceptance? So there's a couple different ways. My favorite is I like them to come out and show this is how much treatment was diagnosed for the doctor and the hygienist. If you have multiple doctors, you track which doctor it was for. You track how much was scheduled. Sometimes your treatment plan is going to be 14 grand because it's huge. There are right. multiple steps. So it's per visit that could actually be tracked. And then you say the date that they scheduled. And if they don't schedule, you write down why they didn't schedule. Was it money? Was it talk to the spouse? What was the reason they didn't schedule? And then schedule yourself a follow-up call. So I like it to be two days after they are seen and they don't schedule, you call them. And then two weeks and then two months to follow up on this treatment. Two days, two weeks, two months. Easy to remember. Super easy. So um, the new dentist travel, <laughs> what was it? The new Dr. Tough new Road. Dr. And... <laughs> Tough Road. N-D-T-I-R. <laughs> T-R. And then, and then the other one is the 222 follow-up. So between those, then you're, you're really following up with all your patients. You're following up with what's going on. You're making sure that they're really being taken care of and they're not slipping through the cracks. So, and if you're tracking all those different things, then at the end of each week, there are a lot of metrics that are being used by other people that they, um, different metrics and things that people are using that they could, if you get um, run over right now, I don't know where you are, but it sounds like there's cars involved. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. You're just fine. The metrics that I have them follow are like tracking which doctor and which hygienist and then following up on that. And if you have one person who's accountable for that and you're tracking the sheet, you can then as a dentist, I usually have it as a Google, like a shared Google doc. And then you can hop on there and see which one of your cases didn't accept, which ones did accept, why they didn't accept and different things like that. Okay. So they... Okay, so the patient comes to the front desk. You're you're huge on route slips and handoffs. They give them the route slip. Are they tracking on the route slip or are they tracking on the Google Doc um, treatment, you know, the amount of treatment that was presented, the amount of treatment that was accepted, what was scheduled? Where is this all happening? So a lot of people use metrics like dental intel or divergent, which sure. are fantastic. I like, I'm old school, but I like to actually see what treatment is coming through. So you're, you're tracking all those metrics on the Google Doc, but you can also use Divergent and Dental Intel to okay. track those metrics easier for you. Okay. But I, I also think that like the advantage of being old school and, and of manually tracking it yourself is that it forces you to pay attention to it. Um, whereas if you have this automatic tracker, it's easier to 
look up the data. Um, if, right. if, you know, compared to if, if you weren't doing it yourself and you were trying to implement that and you're like, oh yeah, we forgot to track this. We forgot to put it in. But by being a little bit old school and tracking it in a Google doc, um, you just have a better gut feel for the data. You have a better, better sense. And so your front desk, uh, treatment coordinator would know like, okay, this is where things are going and here's the trends and here's my Google sheet. And so. I, I think that's great to manually do it. And, and maybe you don't do it like that forever. Maybe you try and increase your case acceptance and you decide we're going to try this for three months and see where it goes and see where right. we can improve. Um, because it is it is timely and there are easier ways to do it. I mean, sometimes I'll print a schedule out and I'll just use two different highlighters for like accepted or not accepted. And then the ones that didn't accept, I follow up on those. Um, but I really love to see which doctor, which hygienist, because sometimes there's a dynamic duo and one hygienist and one doctor really can sell cases better mm. than another hygienist and doctor. So you can see what is going on and then you can actually have training or you can go watch and you can see what the differences are, but it helps you dial in and actually figure out what parts of your case acceptance aren't working or what parts of your exam aren't working, or is it consistent? What patterns? It just allows you to see the patterns more readily and more easily when you actually track it by hand. Cool. That's awesome. Um, so it's, it's something that's going to give you a nice feedback loop that's baked into the way that you schedule patients. And and that feedback loop, I think, is what a lot of people are missing. They're, they're not tracking these things. They're not following exactly what happened to this patient in, in that case. And, and they just don't know. They just, you know, a month goes by and you're like, oh, yeah, I never saw this person again. Um, right. and if, if you don't have that two days, two weeks, two months, um, how much... You know, like people, people do these two day calls, two week calls, two month calls. Um, what response have you gotten from, from your financial coordinators doing these calls? Like, are they surprised that people actually schedule treatment when you do the two days, two weeks, two months, or, or is it difficult to get a hold of people? What, what's the, the trend? It varies. Um, and I feel like it just depends on, you know, if you're going to leave a voice like, Hey, it's Kira, you didn't schedule your treatment. So we wanted to call and just schedule you. That's not a really good call to action. It's sure. you're paying attention to what their personal motivator is. Hey, Kira, you know, I was just giving you a call back because I know you said you're going to talk to your spouse. I wanted to follow up with you and see if there were any questions I could help answer. So being very intentional on those follow-up calls, people tend to schedule. And that's why I like the two days, two weeks, two months. And then after two months, you send a letter and you wait until they come in for their six month, but it tends to be a pretty good rate. But also when the other benefit of it is when your front office knows they have to make those calls, they get really good at closing cases as well because people don't <laughs> like to make phone calls. They don't like to follow up. It's hard. So if they know they have to follow up and you're going to be checking in on them on all these calls, case acceptance naturally goes up as well because there's a, a not as fun of a job if they have to follow up with them later on. That's, that's like the phenomenon when you're using my fitness pal <laughs> You like eat less food because you're like, oh, I don't want to have to freaking put this in my fitness pal. I'm just not going right? to eat it. So exactly. It's perfect. Um, <laughs> same, same model. Same model. So um, these were some really, really great specifics. I want to jump back here kind of as our last thing. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that sometimes, um, you know, new dentists or treatment coordinators have a hard time talking about money. They have a hard time, you know, putting those numbers out there or bigger cases. And so they'll tone it down just so they get a yes. Mm -hmm. How have you helped people get past that mental barrier? Such a good question <laughs> because I deal with this a lot. Yeah. Number one, I think getting into a good space with yourself and remembering that you're doing a service and people need to pay for that service. Like you just need to accept that. Yeah. That you're not, there's nothing wrong with asking people to pay for a service that you did. What's wrong is if we, we didn't talk to them, we didn't educate them and they didn't say yes, then we were in a problem. But if we educate them beforehand, it's okay to talk money. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is don't assume. So often people mm. assume because we connect, we, we're, we're people and we like to connect with others. Yeah. And so when we assume, uh, we assume everyone's just like us. And the reality is we're all very different people. Some people are just like us, but most people aren't and they have different things. So don't ever assume because what we do when we assume is we create solutions to problems we don't even have. We assume that because for me to drop a thousand dollars for a crown is a lot. That's how it's going to be for every single patient. Right. But for a lot of patients, it's not a big deal, but because that's who I am, I'm going to present treatment that same way. I'm going to diagnose treatment that same way. We try to connect with people, but in doing so, we tend to walk ourselves out of treatment case acceptance 
that could be there. So the way I work through this is I just say, you just have to be okay talking numbers. When I first started dropping like 30, 40, $50,000 treatment plans, that yeah. was wildly scary. I felt like I'm like, I'm not even old enough to have a car. Like, <laughs> I don't even know, like, I don't even know what real life is like. And yet I'm telling you to spend 50 grand. Like this is wild for me. Yeah. But I always say you go in, people look for the bottom line. So we're going to, there's two different models. One, we're going to do, I'll give you an example for like fillings, crowns, root canals, the more bread and butter dentistry. I think those treatment plans are very different than your high end big cases that are really expensive. Okay. So if it's like a crown prep, you know what you're going to do. I personally, and every consultant's different. Everyone will tell you differently. My personal, I think it's easy. It's efficient and patients like efficiency. Our doctor just told us NDT. We know what's going to happen. Hmm. The assistant came up front. They said, okay, Kara, here's Sally. Dr. Lowe needs to get her back for the upper right. We're going to do those three fillings. He needs to see her back in two to three weeks. And it's going to take about an hour and a half. And could you please schedule her for her cleaning? Assistant leaves. At that point, me, me, the treatment coordinator say, okay, Sally, uh, let's get you scheduled. It looks like two to three weeks. Dr. Lowe is really busy. Um, I have next Wednesday at eight o'clock. Um, let's, let's reserve that time for you. I personally just like to get them into an appointment. Some people like to go over the financials first. I don't think it really makes a difference. It's really just, they know what they need to do. And we're making that a priority. I maybe, maybe I disagree. I think your method is better. I think um, sometimes talking about the financials first is like assuming that it's con conditional on them accepting the financials that they're going to schedule. Whereas if you schedule first, then it's like assuming they're going to take care of their teeth and accept treatment. And now it's just working out the details. So I like I how you said that. I've never been able to verbalize what I feel internally, but that's exactly how it is because I am assuming that they're going to fix their teeth. I am assuming they want the appointment and I am assuming that because I'm going to respond based on those assumptions. So, and then after that, I print out a treatment plan and I'll go through it. Yes, I tend to, depending upon how big the treatment plan is, if we're talking a couple of things, they're probably coming in for two visits. I print the whole treatment plan. I let them see, yeah. but I also show that it's broken up. This is where like, I have a whole spiel on like insurance and care credit and different options. I am not crazy about presenting all my financial options right away. I like to hold some aces in my pocket. So first yeah. and foremost, I'm going to say, okay, Sally, so it looks like we need to get you back for those three fillings. S um, insurance is estimated to cover or 450. Your out of pocket is going to be 250. And I stop. I'm silent. <laughs> I wait. I don't go on because people tend to rattle and go on and be like, so if that doesn't work for you. We can do care credit and we can break it up in payments. And honestly, we'll just give it to you for free. Right. Like they literally will just roll all the way down. So you just say the first full price of what they need to pay out of pocket and you're silent. So Let them process. What? Let them figure out can they afford that or not. When when are you allowed to speak again? Do they speak next? <laughs> like you have to you're like, okay, insurance is, you know, four hundred and fifty, your out of pocket is two hundred and fifty. And then you just wait. What do you wait for? What's what's the next step? Usually what happens is they'll be like, Okay, that sounds great. But like, great, we've got you on Wednesday, we'll see you at two fifty. Um, and they're like, Perfect, sounds great. You have them sign the treatment plan, scan it and send it with them. If they're like they start to hesitate and you're watching their body language and they're like, um, I don't go in and say like, well, let me give you financial options. I say, all right, let's work through. My job is to help you find a solution to get your treatment completed. Tell me kind of what the struggle is. I let them tell me what's going on. Hmm. They're like, gosh, 250 is really hard for me. I'm like, okay, what could you afford? I don't go into a solution of like, well, if I did care credit, I could get you down to $50 because I'm assuming that they can only afford $50 at that moment. Right. I'm assuming all these different things. So I ask those questions from the patient to give them a solution for what their real problem is, not creating a solution to the problem I think they're having. This is awesome because I've, I've seen people say like, oh, you should have three or four financial options. It should be real simple. It should be on like a single page that your team can can talk about. But you're saying present the obvious option insurance mm -hmm. portion your your portion pause let them process that and say yes or no or, or or not yes or no but you know get through that and either accept move forward or or they have some issues now instead of saying well here's option a b c d instead of overwhelming them you're letting them come back you're saying what could you afford and i mm -hmm. i love that it it seems like a difficult question to ask um, but why? I don't like, know. That's what we ultimately want to know. But we're so, we, as humans, we don't want to be in this uncomfortable world. So we are like, well, um, you can have pink and purple and blue and orange. And we try to get out of it. Right. And in doing so, we're not even giving them what they're actually asking for. Yeah. And I think being intentional 
really, that's when you dial it in. And it's not hard because the reality is if we can like save the patient 15 minutes of not offering them five options of payment yeah. and we can just figure out what they want, that's better customer service and offering three options. Now I'm probably going to be like scorned by a lot of other no. consultants by having this model because there is another benefit of showing them other options that they can pay because then they know what their options are. I know what all the aces in my pocket are. So I tend to go from full payment, see if they can accept that, go to the next one where I do 50, 50, then the next one's going into care credit. And then the last resort is let's take some deposits, book you out three months and have you put deposits down. So I have all these different options, or if they want to pay in full, I'll give them, you know, 5% off or whatnot. So there's lots of different options, but I personally have found you guys can tell my model is I don't like them to be overwhelmed in the exam. I like my doctors to tell them exactly what they need to come back for. I like my handoffs to be spot on. Yeah. I like my handoffs to be transparent. And then I like my treatment coordinators to really just go for what the actual problem is and create the solution for their true problem, not trying to create solutions for problems they don't even have. Perfect. This this is awesome. Um, and I love those two really specific ways. And I think it takes it takes a skilled treatment coordinator to do that. And you, there has to be understanding, training, intention with the desire to give the patient the best solution, but also give the practice the best option that's going to protect the practice. If we just did care credit for everyone, you know, it's like if they can pay right. up front, we'd rather do that than take a 10% hit on care credit. <laughs> exactly. And so, but that's also another thing where manually tracking your treatment, treatment coordinators can put in there like, okay, today I did all three options and these were the case acceptance I got. Today, I just offered in full mm. this one. You can track to see what your yeah. secret sauce is. For me, this is my secret sauce. I can close 40, 50, 60, $70,000 cases with this model. I just go in very confident and I'm like, we're paying for this. My job's to find a solution for you. Yeah, That's my model. So everyone has to find their model of what works for them. But the bottom line is, like you said, know what you want the patient to have. Having that objective, we want them to schedule I want them to pay in full that day. If you know those objectives, like those are your objectives you're trying to get, you will then treatment coordinate differently sure. as opposed to like, well, I just want what's best for my patient. But what's best for the patient is what we assume is best for us. And that's not always what's best for everyone. So I always go with, what does my doctor want? My doctor wants me to schedule. My doctor wants my patient to have a great experience. And my doctor wants the patient to pay in full. Those are the three things I need to work on this and make it, make it happen and do the best that I can possibly do. Awesome. Um, this, this kind of like was, was full of amazing specifics. So I'm just going to go over them again real quick. NDTR. So next appointment date range, uh, time that it's going to take and then recall. And mm -hmm. then, and then we had, uh, for the treatment coordinator, we had their tracking things and calling back two days, two weeks, two months. And then the pregnant pause after offering the, their portion followed up with what can you afford? I think those are all really, really specific things that people can take and implement um, in, in their office. And if this is something that you want Kira's help on, she's got this awesome dentalmastersnow.com that can help you out. <laughs> I don't know who this Master Snow is, but he's good. He's pretty great. He's he great. Good. <laughs> um, and, and I think you said, um, I, I'm hoping we're airing this before October 25th, but you're in October, you're doing an event at in, in Scottsdale, right? Correct. We're going to be doing phone skills and scheduling. Those are two really hard things cool. that don't even need to be hard. It's just this simple verbiage and we can help your teams drill it out, really get comfortable with having those quote unquote uncomfortable conversations and making them comfortable. Awesome. How else can people get a hold of you if they're like, mm, that Kira was awesome. I more Kira is good. More Kira, I hope is always good. Um, always Kira's good. Dental Consulting. You can always shoot me an email, Kira's Dental Consulting at gmail.com. Cool. You can always um, call me. I have clients that call me all the time. I do free consults. Um, really, I just want to help people in whatever way I possibly can. So Dental Master Snow, Kira's Dental Consulting, or you can always give me a call. Awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. This was a blast. It was so fun. Thanks again, Richard. I always love being on your show. We'll have you back for sure. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Okay. That was great. Kira crushed it. She, she always does from her information about handoffs. I, I love her system specifically of NDTR, which is break down what's the next visit for the patient, how the date range for how soon they should come back, how long that appointment is going to take, and then the recall. So that NDTR is going to make it easier for your patients rather than having to accept everything all at once, gives them one thing for their brain to process. The next visit, 
when they should come back and the urgency of that appointment, how long that appointment's going to be, and then also knowing kind of their recall and making sure that they're scheduled for that. I love that she's built this little teeny system and baked that into every single one of the exams that she has her doctors do. And, and we've seen the results from people practicing that. Any, any, any last thoughts on kind of like how people can improve their exams or handoffs or route slips? Do you guys use route slips at your office at all, George? Yeah, we do. We use the uh, pace and vision form. And, uh, you know, I, that's one thing that I'd like us to do better at. I think we use the routing slips, so we don't use them as well as we can. Okay. There's information on them that's being uh, ignored or neglected just because we don't have it very organized. So that's something in the future we'll address. And that's specifically in, in her section of the course. That's one of the things that she really breaks down is not only route slips, but how to incorporate incorporate NDTR into your route slips so that you're using those and also using those route slips in your meetings. So that's something that if any of our listeners are really interested in, definitely jump on that wait list for the course. And um, anything else uh, before we wrap it up, George? Yeah, I'm going to keep harping on this anytime it comes up because I think it should be the one of the biggest takeaways from the season is how much of the case acceptance that she talked about in the episode is not related to the dentist. It's so much more of a team game than people maybe realize. And I think that's what I've realized so far in practice is how much it's on your team and how much we think it's on us only, but it's really everybody, including us. Cool. That was, like I said, another another phenomenal episode. Thank you. And we will talk with you guys next week on the Shared Practices Podcast. Shared Practices Podcast. Shared Practices Podcast. Shared.